Example 150, Coke versus Pepsi. The weights in pounds of samples of regular Coke and regular Pepsi have been summarized below. Sample statistics are shown. Use the 5% significance level to test the claim that the weights of regular Coke and the weights of regular Pepsi have the same standard deviation. Okay, so this problem is, is not very interesting in its topic or subject matter. So what we're doing it for is mainly just to run another example of the test that compares two population variances. And so how do I know that's the hypothesis test I'm dealing with here? Well, of course it says use a 5% significance level to test the claim. So I know it's a hypothesis test, but then it says that these two things have the same standard deviation. So that's the same as asking about the variances. You know that standard deviation and variance are intimately related. They're strictly different by the idea of squaring one to get the other, right? So we square the standard deviation, we get the variance. So we know it's a problem that asks us to compare two variances essentially. All right, when I look at the data, the data is, you know, a bunch of small decimal numbers because obviously the weights of Coke and Pepsi here, if they're coming from, say, bottles of Cokes and Pepsi, they're not going to be um, even a pound usually. So what we're doing is just looking at this to see if there's a difference in the manufacturing accuracy of the two products. Maybe, you know, when they fill the bottles from Pepsi, the machines aren't as accurate as in Coke or vice versa. So that's what we're going to do the comparison for. Um, the thing I want to talk about here in this test, since we've already done one of these in an earlier video, is I want to get into the details a little bit of why the test is conducted the way it is. So let's write the claim down first. It says test the claim that they have the same standard deviation. So I would say the variance for one is equal to the variance for the other. If I if I you know if you remember what I said earlier in the videos earlier, I mentioned that we want to make sure that the one that has the larger variation goes first here for the test. So I see that Coke is a little bit larger than Pepsi here, so I'm going to put that one first. So I'm going to say the variance for Coke is equal to the variance for Pepsi, and again, I put it first. The reason why is usually we do a ratio where we divide this guy and this guy by the same thing. So for example, this claim is exactly the same as this statement here. The variance for Coke divided by the variance for Pepsi is equal to 1. Because if I divide this by the variance for Pepsi, so if I divide the variance for Pepsi by the variance for Pepsi, of course we get 1 because that's the same thing. And if I divide this by the variance for Pepsi, right, then I get this statement here, the variance for Coke divided by the variance for Pepsi. And that will be equal to 1 because I divided this by itself, right? That's an equivalent statement. So what we're saying is, hey, if they're the same, then their ratio should produce 1, right? And that's why the F test, you notice they put the the formula is to put the two standard deviations squared in a fraction, right? And then you divide them. And what we're looking for is whether that fraction has a value that's larger than 1 or equal to 1. The way we set up the test by putting the bigger number on top in every case here, that eliminates the need to worry about the less than 1 scenario. Because if we always put the bigger number on top, then we're either going to get 1 in the case when they're exactly the same or something bigger than 1 when the number on top is larger. But basically here's the logic of the test. If the ratio here is much greater than 1, we'll tend to think that these are not the same. If when you divide the two numbers the ratio is almost 1, then we'll say they're practically the same. So that's sort of the logic of the test. And that's why I asked you before to put the bigger number on top. That will also guarantee that our procedure can be conducted as a right-tailed test, even when it is a two-tailed procedure. We want to do that because getting the left critical value from the tables is um, difficult. So to get to avoid that need, if we make sure that we always put the larger variance on top, we can run it as a right-tailed test in every case, and then our table work will be simple and it keeps the problem nice and easy. Otherwise, getting the left uh, and critical value is difficult with the F table that they give us. So to avoid having to do that, we can instead use this convention, which is that we always put the one with a larger sample variance on top of the statement, and then it'll always produce a ratio that's either one or higher than one if this number is bigger than that number. Okay, so let's go ahead then and continue on. The HO and the HA. The HO is going to be the same as the claim here because the claim has an equal sign, right? So we're going to just, I'm going to use this version of it because it's just less, it doesn't take up as many much space as the other version, right? So there we go. That's the claim written um, as HO because it has an equal sign. And then we'll have HA, which is going to say the opposite of equal to, which of course is not equal to, and that goes there at the bottom. Okay, so you got your HO and your HA. Next step is to get the data. Now the data is already here, so I'm just going to leave the data there and jump right to our test stat then. So our test stat, our test stat, remember, is F. And the way we do it is we create a ratio, right? 
So in this case, we're going to have the standard deviation for Coke divided by the standard deviation for Pepsi, and then we're going to square that fraction, right? Now again, why did I put Coke on top? Because Coke is the first number in my claim here, right? So I want to make sure that I'm consistent. If I use it in my claim first, I use it here first, and then also it's because the Coke value is larger than the Pepsi value. I want to ensure the number is one or larger when I do the calculation. Okay, so I end up with 0 0.007507 divided by 0 0.005701. And then I square. Okay, so let's see what that gives us. 0 0.007507 divided by 0 0.005701. Hit enter, I get 1.32-ish, but I'm going to square that. Don't forget to square it at the end, and you end up with approximately 1.73. 1.73. If you want to go out to one decimal place further, it's 1.734. Okay, so there's my F test stat. Now remember, I need to compare that test stat against a critical value, so I'm going to draw the F bell curve, right? Or it's not a bell curve, but the F curve. It's kind of like a skewed bell shape, right? A really skewed bell shape. Draw a tail here. And that tail is where the rejection region will lie. Now the key thing about this one though is that we're dealing with a two-tailed procedure. So when you have a two-tailed procedure, you need to chop your alpha in half because there, there should be a left critical value as well. But because of the way we set up our tests, we're basically only going to need to worry about a right-tailed scenario here. And what I need you to do then is to just remember though that when it's a two-tailed test, when HA is not equal to, that's a two-tailed test, we're going to take that alpha that they provided us and we're going to chop it in half. So what goes in here is not 0.05, but rather 0.05 divided by 2, or 0.025. So make sure you go to the 0.025 table to look up your critical value. Now that critical value, as mentioned before, is always positive because it starts at 0, the curve. And what's the name of this critical value again? Well, the name of the critical value, remember, is an F critical value. It has degrees of freedom numerator comma denominator degrees of freedom comma alpha so let's get the numerator degrees of freedom what that means is this number that i put in the numerator of my test stat what was the sample size where that number came from well it was 36 if i take one away from it i will get 35. now same thing for the denominator degrees of freedom what's this guy's sample size where that number came from then i take one away from it so i get 35 again and then alpha in the problem, remember we're using half of it because it's a two-tailed test, and 0 0.025. Okay, let's go to our table. Let's look up 35, 35, and 0 0.025. Okay, so we're at the 0 0.025 table, and we need 35 degrees of freedom for both the numerator and the denominator. But the numerator degrees of freedom of 35 is not found on the first page here, so we're going to have to go to the second page. Let's see what that shows. And we'll see that we don't see 35 there either. We see 30 and then 40. Another problem is, as we scroll down, we'll see that there's only 30 and 40 for the denominator degrees of freedom as well. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to notice that our answer is somewhere between these two values and the two values we find. So Let's uh, put a pen here next to the uh, 30, 40 column. So the two columns that are right next to my pen will be the 30, 40 column. That one, when we scroll up, we'll be able to still see both pieces, right? So let's scroll up, and there we have the 30, 40 row at the bottom of our table there. And so what we want to show here, what we want to point out, is that we have four values, actually. If you look at this number, 2.07, that's actually 30-30, so that's 30 degrees of freedom for both, right? 2.07 is 30-30. And then we have 2.01, and 2.01 is actually 30, or 40-30, pardon me, 40 for the numerator degrees of freedom, 30 for the denominator. And then we have 1.88 after that, and that's going to be 40 for both of them, 40 for the numerator, 40 for the denominator. And then if we have 30 for the numerator and 40 for the denominator, we get 1.94. So there's these four values, right? These four values, that little box. And none of them are the values we want, right? Because we want 35, 35. 
So there are different techniques to do this, but I like to keep it simple and I just take the most conservative value. So I'm going to choose 2.07. The reason why it's the most conservative value is because it's simply the biggest among the four values that are around our desired answer, right? If you look at all the values that we have, the largest number is 2.07. And the reason why I want to do that is because remember, if that critical value is farther out into the tail, it makes it less likely that we commit the type 1 error. And remember, we try to avoid the type 1 error. So we set a tolerance limit on it, and in this problem they want us to just set the tolerance limit at you know 5% for two tails, so 2.5% two for that right tail. Well, by making this critical value the larger of the four possibilities that we have that surround the values that we actually want, that number, 2.07, is going to ensure that we commit the type 1 error less often than promised, right? So, you know, normally for a two-tailed test, in this case, it would be an exactly 5% chance we commit the type 1 error. Well, now it's going to be a little less if we choose a critical value that's a little larger than it needs to be. And that's being conservative then, in other words, right? We're committing the type 1 error less than we promised. And that's good because we'd rather do that, right? We don't want to have a situation where we actually commit the type 1 error more often than we promised. If we commit it less often than we promised, people will generally not be unhappy with that. But they'll be unhappy if they find out later that, you know, we actually are more likely to commit the type 1 error than we promised. It seems like we deceived them. You know, if somebody promises a certain quality level and they exceed that quality level, we're not unhappy with that, right? But if they promise a quality level and they don't deliver on it, they do under that value, then we, we usually get annoyed and think that we've been cheated. So I'd rather take the conservative choice, the bigger number. We did this with the t-test as well, and we're doing it again here with the f-test. The number is not directly on the table. Just to keep it simple, take the biggest number that's nearby, and that number will be the value you use. So we're actually choosing 30 and 30 degrees of freedom, right? 30 for the numerator, 30 for the denominator, and our answer we'll choose then is 2.07. Okay, so we found the answer 2.07, 2.07 from our table. That's our critical value. Now we're going to compare our test stat to the critical value. And you can see that the test stat actually doesn't land inside the rejection region. It lands between 0 and 2.07. So we're going to conclude that we do not reject HO. So do not reject HO or the null and therefore do not support HA, the alternative. Now what's our claim? Our claim, if you look at it, is actually HO, so we're going to use this wording. We do not reject the claim. The sample data does not reject the claim. So the sample data does not reject, does not reject the claim. Okay, and what's that claim? The claim is that the two standard deviations are the same or their two variances are the same. And so basically the machines that fill these Coke bottles and Pepsi bottles don't seem to have a statistically significant difference in variation. And that's it.